Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the Truth Is podcast. This is a podcast dedicated to sharing biblical truths as best as humanly possible. So what I like to do is I like to just break it down into simple terms, what the Bible says. And today's episode is all about Jesus loves you. Now, the reason why I went with this as my second episode of the podcast is mainly because I feel like we don't hear that enough in today's world. We don't hear that someone loves us nearly as often as we think we should, or even we really should, because honestly, let me, let me be frank. There are a lot of folks out there that have not felt loved by other human beings. And I was one of them for a long time. I struggled to feel like God would love me. I grew up in a home where my dad um, never only showed me much approval for much of the things I did. So at the end of the day, I felt like if I couldn't win his approval and his love or what I thought his love should look like, then why would God ever love me if my own father wouldn't? And because, you know, the Bible describes him as a heavenly father. He describe they it describes him as, you know, the father in heaven that's not only the father of Jesus Christ, which is by itself amazing and wonderful and just beyond beyond understanding in, in a lot of our cases. But also it's this idea that God is our father, spiritual father, because he adopts us into the kingdom through the sacrifice his son made on the cross. And so that is really um, just so powerful. So um, just the idea that Jesus loves you is so really, um, it's, it, it's beyond understanding for a lot of people. So, John 3.16 is the, is the basic verse that everyone knows. It, it's, it, everyone knows, not everyone understands. That's the problem. Not everyone understands what John 3.16 really says. Um, so I'm going to go to the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. And so this will really bring home what this verse means. It says here, for God loved the world in this way. First of all, imagine that for God so loved the world in this way. When it says in this way, then what comes next is how he loves us, how he expresses his love for us. So then it says, He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The word perish means die, but not die physically. The Bible talks about it is appointed upon man once to die. We will all die the physical, natural death, but... Then there is the judgment, which either lands you in the mercy seat or in the great white throne. And these two judgments are very different. The mercy seat judgment is for the saints who have accepted the gift of God and are given rewards based on their service in the kingdom. Not not that our service saves us, but that our service contributes to the kingdom and that recognition is being given. The great white throne judgment, on the other hand, is where Jesus is conqueror and king. Not that he isn't in the mercy seat judgment. Let me be clear there. He's a conqueror. He's king no matter what. He he rules the world in the last days, but, you know, or in, in, in eternity. But in the, in the in the great white throne judgment, he is literally going and judging those who have never accepted the gift of eternal life through Jesus' sacrifice. So he gave his one and only son. I'm reminded of the story of Abraham 
and his son Isaac, where Jesus, where where God asks Abraham to take Isaac with him and go make a sacrifice to him. And the sacrifice is Abraham's son. Abraham could have said, <laughs> no, God, forget that. I'm not doing that. You promised me a son. I've got him. I'm not giving him back. But instead, here's the thing. Here's the real important thing. Abraham loved God. And he trusted God. God had made him a promise that he would be the father of many nations, that he would have descendants as numerous as the stars, as numerous as the grains on the sands of every shore. That's a lot of people. So imagine that. Um, and it's, by the way, it's not just Israel that's part of that. It's the spiritual descendants as well, the ones who have accepted Christ. I do believe that is part of the promise as well. I may be wrong. I, I do not know. I will admit I do not know. But the, the major thing here with this is Abraham trusted that even if he did have to kill Isaac, God would raise him back from the dead to make that promise come true. That was the thing. And so where it says that in the New Testament, where it says that Abraham's faith accounted for his righteousness or was counted unto him as righteousness, that's because his faith went to a level that most of us could never go. If I had a child, I would not find it very difficult if God said, sacrifice your child to me. I would have a very hard time going, yes, Lord, because I would be very protective of that child. Imagine how he felt about his son. Jesus, not only is he his only son, only begotten or only born son, but it's also the perfect sinless lamb. He hasn't done a thing wrong in his life, and yet the Jews and the Romans are going to kill him because that's what needs to happen in order for us to be set free from sin. That's the thing. God loves the world so much, he's not going to just conquer, but he's going to set us free from the one thing that none of us can say we're free from until we find it in him, and that is sin. Sin is the one thing that we are all going to suffer from because we're born into it. We're born into the sinful nature because man, man fell. Man failed. And so we need a Savior. But if we believe in that sacrifice and we truly take it as face value, not trying to read into it, not trying to trying to game it, not trying to do anything about it, just believing, yes, Jesus died for me, to save me, little old me, insignificant me. Who am I that you are mindful of me, Lord? Who am I that you would consider me, Lord? And yet here God is saying, I love you so much, my son is going to come into the world and I'm going to have him die so that you might be saved. I'm going to come down. Jesus is saying, I'm going to come down and I'm going to live a sinless life. And then I, Jesus, am going to die on a cross to pay for your sins. But that's not all he did. He came back. He came back. You know, um, I heard uh, there's an, a popular video from like a few years ago called The Gospel in, I think, three minutes, four minutes, something like that. And he said, in it, in it the, words are, the words are pretty catchy, but one part of the, of the rap, it's a rap, um, talks about when the tomb opened, heaven all cheered because that means the check cleared. It wasn't just the death that caused the redemption it was the resurrection as well if he just died he'd be like any other man but because he rose again he was not only perfect and sinless but he was also 
God incarnate, God in the flesh, God with us, Emmanuel. That is a powerful thing. That is the thing that really grabs me and just says, oh, if I could have more con conviction about that, if I could have more faith that, that goes to that level where I can really believe that wholeheartedly with no doubts, because even now as a three years recovered addict and, and sold out Christian for Jesus, I'm still at times very forgetful. We get amnesia. Um, there's a song, I don't remember the guy's name, but it's, it's titled Good God, Good God Almighty. And in one verse, he talks about, we get amnesia. <laughs> and it's true. We get amnesia about stuff. We, we think, oh, well, I'm okay. I can do it on my own. I've got a friend um, who is going through some rough stuff, has been for a while. And the thing is, I can see the reason why. And it's because like we all tend to do. He, he relies on God for a bit. He relies on God for a moment because he knows he needs to. But then he gets comfortable and he gets a little bit of control and he thinks, ah, well, okay then. I don't need God in this area. I don't need God here. And it turns into a whole, um, it, it becomes a, point of pride almost and I get this too I do where if I go for a while and I'm doing good and I'm doing better even than I was I'll forget that God's the reason why I'm doing better God's the reason why I'm not in the pit that I was in or in the grave where I should have been or in 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 hell where ultimately I was heading I'll be honest People ask all the time, they ask these evangelists, why does God people, why would a good God send people to hell? He doesn't. We send ourselves there. We're already on our way there. God's just stepping in the middle of the path going, please stop, accept my son's, my son's sacrifice so that you can turn away. You're going down a path that leads to death. Don't do it until we finally get to the end of ourselves and finally admit defeat and finally admit that we're powerless and finally admit that we can't, but God can, we might as well be walking down a path with only one lane, single file, stuck in a line that keeps going towards death because we'll never find a way out besides God. God has to be the one to do it, to, to set us free. You know, I relate, I relate a lot of things in the Bible back to recovery because that's how I've been able to understand the Bible. And honestly, I've talked about this with many people. Recovery isn't just for addicts. Recovery is for all of us. I think the 12 steps should be, should be taught in schools, should be taught in, 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 universities should be taught everywhere because honestly the first three steps are really foundational for any of us and that's this step one i can't do this step two i know a guy who can step three i'm going to choose to let him do it you know at the end of the day we have to realize we're powerless over pla people places things facts of life our past, our future, our thoughts. Number two, we had to realize that God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We can't set ourselves free. We can't make ourselves righteous. We can't make ourselves clean. And we definitely can't make ourselves sane if we've been insane for a period of time. And number three, we had to choose to let him do the work in us that he wants to do. He wants to use us. He wants to set us free. He wants to give us a, a, a hope and a future. You know, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, which are for good and not for evil. 
to give you a hope and a future. It, it, it goes on and says, you know, it goes on and says, then, then you will call on me and come to come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's verse 12, 13, Jeremiah 29, verse 13. When we seek him with all of our heart, with all of our strength, we will find him. We'll find him in the smallest moments. We'll find him in the biggest things. We'll find him in the daily miracles that we have. You know, I like to say every day has miracles attached to it. You woke up this morning. That's a miracle. You're able to breathe today. That's a miracle. You know, the, the, the sheer fact that earth has the exact chemistry in the atmosphere that can keep us alive keep the plants alive, keep the animals alive, keep the fish in the sea alive, is all because God designed this planet as our home. For his glory, for his delight, but as our home. And so I, I, I gosh, if you could only, <laughs> some of the things I've seen as I've walked this path of, these past three years where I've gone from being completely insane to finally finding sanity to finally finding freedom. It's a, it, it's, it's like night and day between who I was and who I am. I can't even begin to express how important it is to know this simple truth. The truth is Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you right now, right where you are, right as you are. And he loves you too much to keep you in the position that you're in. He loves you too much to allow you to continue to hurt and to struggle spiritually as you are. He might not heal us physically, but he does heal us spiritually. He does heal us emotionally. He does heal us ultimately through his gift. But the thing about a gift is you have to accept it. You know, my pastor, I, I, lo I love to share this story. It's really funny. Um, this last December, this last Christmas, I got... Both of our pastors, we've got our our head pastor, and then we recently added a um, an associate pastor just this past year, and I got both of them small gifts. Both of them are not gift people, but they could have made the decision to say, no, I don't want that, give it to someone else, but instead they accepted the gift. I was offering it freely. I wasn't expecting anything in return. I wasn't expecting any conditions to be met in order to give the gift. But they had to be the ones to receive it. And if they didn't, I wasn't going to force it upon them. God is the same way with us. He's offering the gift of salvation through his son. He's holding out his hand. And in it is the gift of free freedom through Christ and eternity with him in heaven. But all he's doing is holding out his hand with the gift in it. He's not forcing it in our face. He's not throwing it at us and beating us upside the head with it. He's not taking a hammer and smashing our heads in in order to get us to take it. He's offering. And it's our decision to accept it and take the gift that's the difference. That's the key. Jesus loves us. He offers the gift. Are we willing to take it? Are we willing to say, yes, Lord, I will choose to be yours? Or are we too full of ourselves? 
Thank you guys so very much for watching, for listening, for sharing, for subscribing, for being here. I appreciate you so much. Take care. I rem I remember every day to pray for you guys. You are so precious in God's sight and you are so precious to me. Thank you so much for being a part of this channel. I hope you have a wonderful, God-blessed day. And I will see you guys again next time here on The Truth Is from the Wandering Wind. Take care.